right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Remember, the whole book of 1 Corinthians is about getting back to Jesus. The church at Corinth uh, had gotten saved, radically saved. They were sharing their faith. They were, um, you know, had grown as a church, but they had not really grown beyond their initial birth. They had entered into a period of, of stagnant growth and therefore spiritual immaturity. And so they had formed factions, you know, because, and that split the church into fractions. And, and then they, you know, they had sexual immorality going on in their church. They were suing each other. Things that they should have known were no-nos that they were going on and doing and really didn't see the negative impact it was having, not just on their own walk with the Lord, but on their witness in their city. And so Paul writes this letter of correction to remind them of, of what's true to, and to bring them back to Jesus so they can start growing and that way they can go on unto maturity. That is the goal of every uh, church, every believer is that, you know, as people get saved, they go on to maturity and then they lead other people to Christ and bring them and then they go on to maturity and then they, you know, you see how it works? The idea of faithful men teaching faithful men and faithful men, the idea is this line going on as we share our faith with others and, and grow in, in our walk with the Lord. Well, in addition to the problems that Paul had seen, had heard about at Corinth, they also had some questions because of their immaturity, things they should have known by this point but didn't because they really weren't going deeper with God's word. And so part of what they had asked him about was concerning those who were married and concerning those who were single. So after answering the Corinthians' questions concerning singleness and marriage, Paul, in verse 25 here of 1 Corinthians 7, he now turns to their questions concerning engaged couples. So they were wondering, should we break off our engagement to serve the Lord in our singleness since, you know, we can get more done that way? Or, or, and was it wrong for those, remember this is a different culture, but was it wrong for parents in that, to arrange marriages for their children if it would be better for them to be single and serve the Lord? So they didn't know, they didn't want them to do the wrong thing here. And, and so Paul addresses that. And in his answers, we see a man who understands the time is short, that the world as we know it is dying and that God's plan is wrapping up. And so as we see Paul's urgency, the urgency behind his answers uh, this morning may it affect us powerfully too, that so that whatever your marital status might be this morning, all of us will be living all out for the Lord with the time that we have left. So verse 25, first Corinthians seven, Paul says, now concerning virgins. The word there, it means those who have never been married. Um, so it's just not, it does not mean single people. This means those who have never been married. And in this case, the word virgin is masculine. So Paul's thinking of the, the young single guys right now. He says, now you guys, you've never been married before? He says, I have no commandment of the Lord. <laughs> he says, the Lord never said anything about this. Yet I have give my judgment as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. The word judgment there means a deliberately formed opinion based on one's gathering of knowledge. So this is not a command from the Lord. Rather, this is Paul saying, I've really thought about this. I've studied it. I've gathered together all the information possible from scripture, and I'm going to give you my informed opinion. See, unlike mixed marriages, like for a, a person who's married to an unbeliever, like we studied last week, uh, where Paul at least then had Jesus' teachings on marriage and divorce to fall back on, Jesus never, he never addressed engaged couples, never once. So Paul has no commands here for engaged or pre-engaged people. He doesn't have anything to say to them that's a command. He simply shares principles and truths to guide these folks or you folks in your decision-making process. But he, you know, Paul's advice isn't to be dismissed because he does believe the Lord is guiding him to a trustworthy answer. He says, I I, as one, I, I'm giving you my, my informed opinion as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. You know, the word faithful means trustworthy or reliable. You know, Paul believes that God's guiding him to good advice here. And we know that's true because it became scripture. So his advice is found here as simple advice is in verse 26. He's going to give more detailed advice later. But in verse 26, he says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. And then he explains, I say that it is good for a man to so be. To so be what? 
Well, the word this there, this is good, refers back to verse 24, where Paul said, brethren, let every man wherein is called there and abide with God. If you get saved and your spouse isn't saved and that's, that's, your, that's where you got called to the Lord, stay there. You know, if you got called and you're single, he says, try to stay there. If not, then you can get married and that's okay. But the idea was, is you don't need to leave the situation that you're in. Remember, you're circumcised, don't try to fix that. Stay there. If you're not, don't get circumcised. Whatever the calling that you were in, where you were at, where the Lord called you, stay there. And so he says the same thing to those of you who are engaged or pre-engaged. He says, stay in the state where you are right now. If you're engaged, you don't need to break it off. If you're not, you know, then you don't need to try to get engaged. He says, you know, just stay where you are because uh, it's good for a man to be so right where God wants you to be. Now, he mentions here this present distress. The reason he brings that up is because the phrase of present distress means imminent or impending hardship. See, Jesus taught that great trials would occur prior to his return. And Paul has that in mind when he says this. See, Paul believed Jesus' coming was imminent, so he consistently taught the churches about living all out for the Lord right where you are right now. Now, if the Lord's return was imminent back then, uh, it isn't it much more so 2,000 years later? You know, we need to be living all out for the Lord with everything we've got, completely sold out, whatever situation we find ourselves in and concerning, you know, our, uh, what, you know, work related to marriage, all those types of things. We need to serve the Lord completely, whatever situation we find ourselves in. So he says, are you bound to a wife? You know, don't seek to be loosed. Are you engaged? The, the word bound there, uh, engagement, you have to realize, was considered a legal contract in most cultures back then. These days, you know, you just give back the ring or sometimes you don't. Um, but, you know, engagements were considered legal binding contracts in most cultures. In fact, in Jewish culture, breaking an engagement required a letter of divorce. Remember with Joseph and Mary when he found out that uh, Mary was pregnant? And what does it say in Matthew that he was going to divorce her privately? He didn't want to make a big stink about it, but he was going to divorce her. You might say, well, they're not married yet. Why would he need to divorce her? In Jewish culture, you had to get a divorce if you were engaged. So there was a very uh, strong binding. So the idea here is, he said, are you engaged? Are you bound? You're committed already to a, to a wife? He says, don't try to get out of it. Don't try to untie that commitment. That's what the word loosed means. Are you loosed from a wife? Have you already, you know, gotten out of a commitment? To, you know, then don't go seek a wife, you know? You know, he basically he's saying, you know, whatever your situation, serve God right where you are. That's Paul's inspired advice. And yet, you don't have to follow it because it is advice. He says, verse 28, but, and if you marry, you have not sinned. And then he says, um, about the, the turns to the ladies, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. The word virgin there, same word, but feminine. So he's turning to the ladies. So either way, Paul is not forbidding marriage. But what he says, though, is he says, nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. And I, but I spare you, or I'm seeking to spare you. So Paul doesn't forbid marriage. He's not saying you do anything wrong if you do that. He's advising against it because he felt it created extra difficulties in life, ones that he wanted to spare them of. So Paul isn't speaking negatively about marriage. We're going to get into this in a moment. What he's explaining, though, is, is that the time is short in his mind. Jesus could come back at any moment, so your time to do the Lord's work might run out. So consider that when you make your decision. You know, when I perform a wedding, just before I ask the couple if they're ready to pronounce their vows, I tell them, your paths will now be parallel. Your responsibilities will increase, but your joy will be multiplied. You know, Paul had a very high view of marriage, a wonderful view of marriage. And the spiritual benefits of marriage are awesome, but it also adds responsibility. Because now you have two missions in life, to serve the Lord and to serve your spouse. And so Paul says, because of that everyday trouble, the trouble in the flesh, the stuff you're just going to face in daily life, he says that can create conflict and a temptation to compromise. See, a married person doesn't have the option to leave their spouse to do God's work, you know, if they're not cooperating. Or they don't have the option to disobey the Lord to serve their spouse. So that can be tricky to work out at times. And so Paul advises those who haven't taken that step yet, if you're not engaged, you know, you should consider that you have a job to do and Jesus is coming soon before you take that big step and say, I do. Verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the time is short and it remains that both they that have wives be as though they that have none. 
So there's no command here. If you are, you know, today you're not engaged or, or you are engaged, he's, Paul says a choice is yours. You can go get married or you can stay single. It's up to you. And that's the first thing we need to understand about living in a world that's dying. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't just kind of batten down the hatches and hold on until Jesus comes back, you know. We have a job to do to go out into all the world and to make disciples. And we're to do that with our, till our last breath, you know, or Jesus comes back, right? That's our job. So we need, that we need to do that. That is all of our calling. We're all called to make disciples, okay? So, but in, in light of the fact that Jesus can come back soon and we have a task in front of us, you know, he says, even though you're free to make that choice, following the Lord is always your first priority, even if you are married. For he says, the time is short. And the phrase there I say means uh, to explain more fully the implications of what I've already said. So let me explain a little bit fuller, okay? Let me tell you why I'm so urgent about this. He says, the time is short. The word there means wrapping up, drawing to a close, you know? And he says, as a result, it remains, means as a result that they which have wives will be as though they had none. See, because Jesus can return at any moment, Christian marriage is unique. It's not like anybody else that gets married because each generation of the church could be the last. There's no guarantee that, you know, if you, you know, I used to, when I was at Bible college, um, I, I, you know, well, I go back a little bit further. Growing up, um, I, I came from a dysfunctional family like everybody else, okay? I always get, I always hear people say to me, you know, you don't understand, Pastor Well, I came from a dysfunctional family. Who didn't? I mean, honestly, who didn't, you know? You know, I, you think things are normal because that's what's in front of you. I remember when, when I started dating Beverly and uh, she came over to our home and there was one time where we all got in this big, huge, loud ruckus of a fight, shouting match, and she went out crying. And we all looked around, you know, they all looked around at me going, what's wrong with her? That was our normal. <laughs> dysfunction. <laughs> you know, we all have our, our dysfunction, you know, and we're all sinners. So we all come from a dysfunctional family, but growing up in my family, um, even with those dysfunctions, you know, my, my mom and dad, despite their problems, they had a very affectionate marriage and I never wanted to be alone. I wanted to, you know, marry someone and I want to have a family with them and we'd have lots of kids and take over the world, you know, <laughs> it was our plan. But you know, I didn't have high aspirations. It wasn't so much career driven or anything like that. I just wanted to share life with somebody. And uh, so, you know, I had no intention of, you know, waiting till I was an age to get married. I didn't have other things I wanted to accomplish first. So when I went to Bible college, you know, and, and we're studying Daniel and Revelation and talking about the Lord's return, I was like, you know, I would tell my roommate, I said, you know, I, I don't know if I want Jesus to come back just yet. You know, I mean, I want to, I'm engaged. I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to, you know, do some things and fulfill our dreams, you know, whatever, you know, because I'd had all these since I was younger. You know, and, and what I learned through that was, you know, there's no promise of that. I mean, none. You get married, say I do, and be like, you may now kiss the bride and whoo, trumpet sounds and you're up. You know, and she's going to leave you for another man, Jesus. <laughs> he's way better than you. <laughs> but the, the point being, every generation, each generation of the church could be the last. So, you know, they, this means every couple faces the reality of, of you know, we have to live in light of, of a different outlook than everybody else does. And in addition to that, you know, there's the reality that we face of living during the apostasy and the persecution that precedes Jesus' return. You know, at different times throughout history, Satan's plan, the Second Thessalonians chapter 2 calls it the mystery of iniquity. You know, this unfolding plan that he has. You know, we, we say that God loves you and has a plan for your life. That's 100% true. There's another thing out there, another truth out there, though. Satan hates you and he has a horrible plan for this world. That is true, too. It's called the mystery of iniquity. And so within that mystery of iniquity, he's always trying to bring his man, his leader onto the, onto the scene and to bring to pass his plan. And, and so he doesn't know, you know, time. He doesn't know when God's going to allow that to happen. And so throughout history, you know, that plan has begun to be enacted and, and, and he, he, you know, people have risen up to persecute Christians. Now those have eventually died out because the spirit of God, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, is holding him back until the time permitted by God. But Satan doesn't know when that timing, when God's timing is. So he's always trying to snuff God's people out of existence, which means we must all be living with a loose hold on this life. You know, it's not wrong to make plans. It's not long to have dreams. You know, New Year's Day is coming up and, and 
New Year's Eve, when we finally get the kids to bed and, you know, we kind of stare at each other with exhaustion, we have a conversation almost every New Year's Eve. And we say, where would you like to be this time next year? And we share our hopes and dreams. We share some of the things that we've been praying about that God maybe put on our hearts. And, you know, some of those things happen. But, you know, sometimes as the year goes by, the Lord has a different plan, his work, his, his plan. And we have to set some of the things that maybe we wanted to do aside because his plan comes first. So we need to all live with a loose hold, you know, on this life. Now, I, I've had the privilege of being involved with Calvary Chapel for, you know, over 20 years. You know, I, I've had very godly mentors, men who are now, you know, up there in age. They've been married a long time. They've served God a long time. But as I talk to them now, as they're in their older age, you know what I hear many of them saying? That they and their wives have decided They've decided they're going to spend even less time with each other because there's so much work left to do. There's so much that needs to be passed on to the next generation. You know, love your wife, guys. Love your husbands, gals. But, but you know, I, I told Beverly something when we started dating. I said to her, I said, listen, I said, I think you're a real special lady. And I'm, I'm pretty intense. So, you know, I said to her after a month we've been dating, I said, I think you're the one. I, don't, I made up my mind. I made up my mind before we were dating, but... She finally came around. <laughs> but I said to her, I said, you need to know something. You'll always be number two. You'll never be number one. And if you ever try to make, make me make a choice between that, you'll always lose. And she said to me, this is why I love her. Got me all fired up. She said to me, she goes, oh, well, that's good. Because you'll always be number two. And don't ever come between me and Jesus. And you know, I've been so blessed over the course of my life that she has always freed me up to do what we have prayed together and knew that's what God wanted me to do. And I've done the same thing for her. If she's come to me and said, Will, I feel like God wants me to do this. I say, you go, you go. I got the kids, I'll take care of the house. I'll, I'll take care of whatever needs to get done. You go, you serve the Lord. And we've done that our whole lives, you know? We have never been jealous about our time with each other. Now, we, we make it a priority. I, I make it a priority that when I'm home, I'm home. You know, and, and that way, my kids always have access to me. And I try, we try to spend time as a family together. Me and Beverly have a very close relationship. We talk all the time, spend time together a lot. But my, my point is, is that you know, that is not an idol in our life. And it never will be. Because Jesus comes first. Jesus comes first. You know, love your spouse, but do not love them more than Jesus. And don't hold on to them so tightly that if they were taken away, that you couldn't function anymore. You know, make time for one another, but provide time for serving the Lord too. Now, some of you here, married folks today, are living like you're single now, and it has nothing to do with serving Jesus, <laughs> you know? And that's not what I'm saying here. Serve your spouse and serve the Lord. It's not an either or decision. Which is why Paul's saying, I'm trying to spare you some trouble here. It's a greater responsibility. He says, and they that weep as though, verse 30, though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. You know, there's nothing wrong with mourning or celebrating. Me and Beverly celebrated our 20th anniversary this year and we had fun, you know. But if the Lord had something else, you know, in mind, we would do that too. And we would say, we'll, we'll have our fun later if time permits. And then there are times when difficult times come around, but you can't let them paralyze you. Neither of those things should keep us from doing God's work because a day might come. There won't be time for mourning or celebrating only time for running for your life or forgiving your life for the gospel. When you make a stand, in fact, many Christians in the middle East or Africa already live this way every day. Paul says they that buy as though they possessed not you know, you've heard it probably said many times, there's nothing wrong with possessions only when they possess us, right? And yet, if persecution comes, would you be okay with losing it all? Or if the Lord were to come to you and, and say, listen, I know that you've been pursuing this with your money, but I want you to help out this missionary. Or I know you've been pursuing this with your money, but I want you to be a part of this ministry. I want you to, I know, you, you know, I know you've been saving up to buy this boat. And, or I know you bought this boat and you've been using it for the last 10 years, but it's distracting you from what I want you to do. And so no more fishing. Would you shake your fist at God? See, Paul says, even though we're making purchases, we need to live our lives as if we own nothing because it can all disappear in a snap or God might ask it to give it, us to give it up in a snap. In verse 31, they that use this world as not abusing it. 
You know, Jesus didn't call us to remove ourselves from the world. The word used means to deal with or make use of. Listen, we buy, we sell, we work, we play. There's nothing wrong with that. And and in our culture, particularly right now, we don't experience a lot of persecution. So, you know, we don't interact in some of the ways that I've described here, you know, uh, of the difficulties of running for your life or fearing for your life. But listen, we're not to dig our roots deep. Paul says, don't, as those that are abusing it. You know, they that use this world is not abusing it. The word abusing means to be engrossed in or fully occupied by. We're not to be fully engrossed in. We're not to dig our roots deep here. We must have a light touch on everything. Because Paul says, what you and I see now, it's not gonna last. He says, for the fashion, the outward appearance, the mode of existence, you know, the current, you know, uh, MO of the world, you know, it's, 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 it's passing away, Paul says. It's dying. You know, when we look at the plan that Satan has for this world, it's destruction. And when he begins to enact that plan and the spirit of God lets him, he pulls aside. When the church is raptured, he pulls aside and Satan brings his man onto the scene and man is allowed to accomplish whatever they want. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, if if the son of man didn't return, there'd be no life left. We'd wipe each other out. And then when Jesus comes to rescue the world and to judge those who are destroying it, what he's going to do, he's not going to remake it like this one. He's going to remake it in a way that pleases him. So what you currently see, what we currently understand as normal life or everyday life, that's not going to be the way it's going to be. Turn over to 1 John chapter 2 with me. Must have a light touch. 1 John chapter 2, just a few books before Revelation at the end. Verses 15 through 17 in 1 John chapter 2. The apostle of love, he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't be devoted to this current mode of existence and be devoted to the Lord. You can't. I mean, one's going to suffer. One's going to, you know, one's going to, you know, be tugging on the other one and eventually you, you make a choice. So he says, don't love the world. If that's the case, then there won't be a love for the father inside of you. For all that is in the world, verse 16, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the, or lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it's not of the father. It's not from the father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust thereof, the desire thereof. You know, when you're in, in heaven, you're not gonna, you know, drive by Dunkin' Donuts and pine for the, the new blueberry, raspberry, whatever drink, you know, that's there, you know. You're not gonna crave those things, you know. The, the desire is gonna be gone. The way we interact with the world will be completely different. What's gonna last? It says, well, he that does the will of God, he remains forever. And so what I ask you this morning, how tightly are you holding to the things of this life? things that are dying. You know, how tightly are you holding to your career? You know, how tightly are you holding to your home, to your position in society? Doing God's will must be the thing that you and I are clinging to. You know, storing up treasure in heaven and not here is the normal Christian life. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not up here saying something radical, you know, you know, Jesus didn't say this very much, but you know, we're radical here. I'm, this is the normal Christian life. We should all be living this way. And marriage creates some challenges in regards to that. You know, Paul says, but, verse 32, I would have you without carefulness. The word there, carefulness, means free from anxiety. You know, in light of everything I've just said, I don't want you to to have to sometimes feel like you're making decisions that put tension in 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 your life. See, it was Paul's inspired opinion that marriage created anxieties in living for Christ that don't exist for the single person. And so his wish, based on that opinion, is to spare his single listeners that anxiety if they could handle being single. Now, if you are not can't handle that, that's fine. You got the fire inside? Paul's already said, better you get married than to burn. But if you can, he says, you should try it. For he says, he that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 
But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between the wife and a virgin, the never married young lady. He says, the unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Again, Paul isn't saying that single people are more spiritual than married people. People can be carnal no matter what their marital status is, and I've found it everywhere. What Paul is saying is that it's more challenging for the married person to serve the Lord because they have the added responsibility of serving their spouse, and they cannot neglect either responsibility. See, pleasing your spouse does not oppose pleasing the Lord. It's an addition. And, and if you feel you have to displease the Lord to please your spouse, then you're not loving your spouse. What did John say? He said, because this is love that we what? Keep his commandments, right? So he calls us to love him first, to make him the priority no matter what. In contrast, though, the single person has only one responsibility. So if you're single and you could pull it off, stay single, he says. But if you can't, that's okay. Verse 35. And this I speak for your own profit, your own advantage. I'm just trying to help. Not that I may cast a snare upon you. And the word there means to like throw a bridle upon a horse or to put a noose around your neck. I'm not trying to restrict you. I'm not trying to make your life miserable, he says. He says, but rather for that which is comely, what's best for you, what's proper for you. And God has a different plan for each of us. And he says that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Literally, it means to be unencumbered, without encumbering. Now, this was the same word used for Martha's busyness when Mary sat at Jesus' feet. You remember that story? When she was complaining to Jesus. So Jesus, you know, I'm doing all this work to make dinner and prepare this big feast for, for you and everybody who's coming over. And my sister's just sitting there listening to you talk to her. Tell her to come help me. And what did Jesus say to her? Martha, Martha. And you are busy about many things. That's what that word is here, busy. It means you are encumbered. You are sidetracked, distracted by things you don't need to be. We're going to be fine for the feast, you know? But Mary's chosen what's more important, which is sitting at my feet. And you need to choose that too. Later on, we see her and she's serving again, but without the attitude. She was unencumbered then, okay? So Paul's saying, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on single people. He's simply trying to give good advice. See, Paul was so wrapped up in the business of God's kingdom, he had no time for anything else. So he thought, what, wouldn't it be great if all you single people did the same thing as me? Think of how many we could win to Christ. That was his mindset. And yet, this is just Paul's opinion. But it may be one that speaks to you today if you're single, because it is inspired by God. And it's meant to encourage some of you to do that. Now, for others, it won't speak to you, and that's okay too, because it's not a command from God. The command from God is to be all in with whatever we choose. Verse 36. But if any man think that he behaves himself uncomely or dishonorable toward his virgin, you know, if she passed the, now he's kind of referring to the, 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 you know, dad who's, you know, normally would arrange a marriage. And if he's arranged a marriage and he feels like he's being dishonorable by not following through with it, you know, if she past the flower of her age, if she's beginning to get older and past her prime because he's holding off so she can serve the Lord and need so require, the word need means he's under obligation. He's made a commitment to marry her off already. He says, well, then let him do what he wants. He does not in sin. Let them marry. It's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Or if you're the, the guy in the marriage, you know, and you say, you know, listen, sweetie, you know, I know we've been engaged. We've been planning this our whole lives, but we need to, you know, use our single time to serve the Lord, you know, and she starts looking at the clock and she's going, I'm 32, bro. You know, time's passing by. You know, he's, let him marry. He says, you don't do anything wrong by that. Nothing wrong. If you've arranged a marriage for your daughter, he says some negatives can occur if you hold off the wedding so the two of them can serve the Lord. And the father might look like he's stringing the girl along or it might be seen as going back in your commitment or you're not committed if you're the guy. Or she might start becoming too old to find a husband and you'd be condemning her to loneliness. In all these cases, Paul says, go ahead and get married. There's nothing wrong with that. But he says, if you stand your ground, that's good too. Nevertheless, verse 37 he that stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, the word there means obligation. In other words, he's, she, his daughter's not engaged. He says, you know, you don't have a commitment yet. 
He says, but he has no necessity, but he has power over his own will. You, you're free to do as you want because you don't have a commitment yet, no, no engagement commitment. And he is so dis- decreed, decided in his heart that he's going to keep his virgin, you know, that she's going to stay single and serve the Lord. Well, he does well too. So then he that gives her in marriage does well, <laughs> but he that gives her not in marriage does better. <laughs> and again, that's Paul's opinion. That's not scripture. It's not a command. It's just Paul's opinion. And within that opinion, there are inspired principles and truths that all single people should consider. And my question to you this morning, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just asking you, have you considered it? And I ask you a follow-up question. Are you serving the Lord with your singleness? You know, when I go through my studies, I always try to make sure I'm not out in left field. And so at the end of my study, I'll, in preparation, I'll read commentaries by other godly men who have taught the word. And and as I went through this, I found that almost all of them had a story that they told of someone who was in their church who was single and they were just pining to be married. I've got to be married. I'm going to be miserable until I'm married. You know, and they would tell them, no, you need to serve the Lord with your time. You know, take the time that you have, the free time you have now and just pour yourself into serving the Lord. And then every single one of them almost had a story where they told of how that person went on the mission field and then they found their wife or they, you know, got a bit, bit, uh, joined a ministry or they served in a couple ministries and ended up there. The uh, the same guy was there that became their wife or their husband, you know, was there. You know, if you are indeed meant to be married by God, then the Lord wants to teach you to put him first, first. Because if you won't do it now, you're not going to do it when you're married. And it's harder when you're married because you're not allowed to slack on either commitment. You need to be faithful to both. Because the question, I mean, because once you say I do, there's no going back. Verse 39, he says, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. That word bound there, it's in the perfect tense, which means a completed action with ongoing results into the future. It doesn't change. This is something that happens and then it doesn't change. You are bound. God, the word there means to supernaturally glue together. You know, God supernaturally glues two people together when they make their vows and they become one. Now, the phrase by the law, there's no the there. It just means by a rule, by a principle. There is no law like this in, the, in the, the Mosaic law. There's none of this. You know, this is the law that was given or the rule given back by God in Genesis chapter two and then confirmed by Jesus in Matthew 5, Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 16. And so Paul says, if you decide to say I do, then you need to stick with it. There's no going back. Now he says, if the husband be dead, obviously if the wife as well, then you're at liberty to be married to whom you will, except in the Lord. You know, if you decide to forgo being single and the advantages it affords in serving God, then you are bound to stay married until death dissolves your wedded bonds. You are bound to serve the Lord from that point forward and your spouse, even if it gets difficult. Even if it gets difficult. Now, if your spouse should die, then the scriptural principles for singleness apply With one little caveat here, he says, if your previous spouse was a non-believer, you need to marry a Christian one this time, okay? And yet, Paul says, I think you'll be happier if you stay single, verse 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, after my informed opinion. Now he started this whole conversation off. And Paul says, I think also I have the spirit of God. It's my opinion, but he believes it's a good one. (laughs) He believes it's based on the spirit moving in his heart. And, And we know that's true because it's scripture. And so, you know, I would ask us, you know, here and now, you know, are we listening to what God has to say? I realize that whether you're single today or you're engaged or whether you're married, that you may be going through some difficulties right now, that that might be hard, but you need to be obedient to the Lord. That's what we're called to do. You know, he purchased us with his own blood. We belong to him. And he's forgiven us of all of our sins. Should we not give everything to him? So do we trust the Lord that his way is best and not, or 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 we're gonna lean on our own understanding? We read in 2 Peter chapter three in our scripture reading, and I'd like to return there because it reminds us. This was a consistent theme from all of the New Testament writers. Jesus is coming soon. How should we then live? So let's turn back there to 2 Peter 3. I want to close with these verses. In 
know, the choice is yours. You can stay single, get married. You know, God's given each of us a gift and you can choose to do with that what you want. But whatever your gift or whatever you choose to do, you need to make the Lord your first priority. And whatever you decide, you need to be all in, all the way. Because the reality is, the Lord's coming soon. 2 Peter 3, verse 11, Peter says, seeing then that all these things, everything out here is gonna be dissolved. Your marriage bond someday will be dissolved, either by death or the Lord's return. So seeing then that all these things and all the things you build together, those will go away too. He says, what manner of persons ought you to be in all, King James says, holy conversation. It means holy conduct and godliness. What, what kind of godly people should we be? What kind of conduct should we have that's different? Holy means separate, different. Well, he says, verse 12 is it. We're to always be looking for and hasting or hurrying, or, you know, hoping it comes quick, the coming of the day of God. In that day, it says the heavens will be on fire and everything's gonna be dissolved. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. See, we, according to his promise, we're not looking for things to get better here. We're looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. You know, aren't you looking forward to the day when you open up your web browser and you don't see a story about some guy going on a college campus and stabbing 10 people? Aren't you? I am. You know, by the time I got done with Daniel Revelation at Bible College, you know, I, 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 I'm, I wanted to get married, but Jesus would come back at any moment and I'd have been way happy. Way happy. Because while the Lord has blessed me so much and I have so many good things in life that I, as he says, you know, tells us to richly enjoy, I do richly enjoy them. Nothing compares to being with him. Nothing compares to saying goodbye to all the pain and the difficulty that we experience in this life. So we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So in light of this, wherefore, beloved, you are greatly loved by God. Seeing that's what you're looking for. He says, be diligent, work hard, you know, that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. See, whether you're single today and you're struggling, or whether you're married today and you're struggling, let's be diligent to serve our Lord with all we've got, amen? With everything in us. And you know, I can't think of a better time to recommit ourselves to that than when we remember what he gave for us at the Lord's Supper today. When we hold that bread and hold that cup and we remind ourselves about everything that Jesus has done for us. What better day to make that commitment? To say, God, I'm all in. This is where you've got me. This is what I've committed. This is what I've decided to do. I'm all in. And where I'm at right now, I'm gonna go for it and hold nothing back. Because I promise you, when the trumpet sounds or you breathe your last, it'll be a joy to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you faithful over many. So anyway, we'll pick it up in chapter eight next week. So I'm gonna invite the worship team to come on up. And the ushers are gonna begin to get the elements ready to pass out. But before they do, you know, we're about to remember the great love Jesus showed us by stepping into our world to die for our sins. I mean, that's what we do when we take the bread. We're remembering that he took on our flesh. He became a man. You know, he, he stepped into our world. He stepped out of perfection, a world that was perfectly right, a, a place that was perfectly righteous, heaven. And as we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it what? Is in heaven, right? So he stepped out of a place where everything was perfect into our mess. And then he lived a perfect life, even though he struggled with all the things that we do. He experienced temptation. He experienced fatigue, all those things he experienced. He experienced hurt from friends and family, all that stuff. He experienced loss. And yet he lived without giving in. And then even though he, because he had done perfectly and could have waltzed right into heaven, he went to the cross to pay our price because we don't. When we take the bread and hold the cup, what we're declaring is that we're, I'm identified with that. I have failed to meet God's standard. I'm a sinner, but I'm resting in his forgiveness because of his, my faith and his sacrifice on the cross. So this is not just a ritual that we do. And if that's not your declaration today, if you don't believe that, you know, this is not just something to do because everyone else is doing it. But rather than have the plate pass by and you not grab it, What's keeping you from making that declaration? You know, the Bible predicts that if Jesus didn't come back to rescue us, we'd eventually wipe ourselves out. And that prophecy 
seemed absurd to some 2,000 years ago, but not anymore. We fully have that capability. And I would ask you to take a good hard look around you. Time is wrapping up. The end is here. And when it does, where is that going to leave you? See, 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9 says, But beloved, don't be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slack. He's not lazy concerning his promise. Oh, you preachers been saying Jesus come back for 2,000 years. You're right. That just means it's closer. But see, God is not lazy. He's long-suffering because he doesn't want anyone to perish. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because once that door closes, it's shut. So you have time now. So what are you going to do? You know, Jesus came with a message and it was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The word repent means to turn, to change, to quit going the direction you were going and move in a different direction. And when we repent, what we're saying is, God, I know I fall short. I'm not a good person. I'm not good enough just to go into heaven on my own. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to trust in my own rightness. I believe you died for me on the cross and I want to trust you. Will you please forgive me based on what you did, not because I'm good enough. And the Bible says when you do that, he wipes away all your sin and he makes you his child. So we're gonna pray in a moment. When I, we do, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to receive the Lord so that when this comes around, you don't have to just pass it by, but you can take it and celebrate with us. Well, Lord, we do thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we don't wanna be, Lord, stubborn and hard-hearted when it comes to your command to us to put you first. Lord, I know that there may be some of us today who are struggling in our marriage, or maybe, maybe it's just maybe one specific area might be struggling in your marriage, and, and there's a hard heart there. Lord, we don't, we don't want that, and we commit now. We want to soften our heart and ask that you would plant that seed there so that it can grow and we can blossom and start to live that out in obedience to you. Lord, there may be others here today in a different situation that we don't want to harden our heart. Lord, we want to be soft and tender to you. And so we open our heart to you, Lord. And we say, Lord, put in whatever you need to put in. Do whatever surgery you need to do. Lord, we, I want to serve you with everything that's in me in whatever status I'm in right now. I want to give you everything. And Lord, as we do so, we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit so we can be empowered to keep that commitment because we can't do it in our own strength. Lord, will you help us with that? And will you use us for your glory? Lord, we give this time to you now to remember you and to celebrate what you did for us in Jesus' name, amen.